One, two, one, two, check, check, check. Are we ready to start uh, the podcast? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Bedroom Super Producer Podcast. We are your hosts. My name is JT. My name is BK. And I gotta say, BK, I'm very, very excited for today's uh, subject. It is, uh, I'll go as far as saying that it is my second favorite band of all times. Interesting. Second favorite band, I see. If uh, people out there have been listening to all the episodes, they know what my favorite band of all times is. A French duo by the name of Daft Punk. But what is BK, my second favorite band of all times? Is it also a French duo? I believe so. I believe that you are referring to Justice, the French electronic music duo uh, consisting of none others than Mr. Xavier de Rosnay and Mr. Gaspard Auger. Many of them have compared them to, to Daft Punk as like the new generation of Daft Punk, but I believe they're, they're, they're a band of their own and they're, they, they bring a special style to the table. I believe the way they link disco, new wave, pop, rock, electro, the, the house and dance is a very, they have a very unique way of doing things. Of course, they have kind of a similar story to Daft Punk. They were also discovered by Pedro Winters, Pedro Winters, who used to be uh, Daft Punk's manager, which is now Justice's manager, also the head of the head banger record uh, company, uh, the French the French record label, uh, home to many great artists, uh, Feeds, uh, Breakbot, uh, Sebastian, Uffy, all those who knows the who know the the French the French house movement know all these names. And so these these two cats have been pretty much uh, doing their thing since their, their launch of their debut albums in 2007. And uh, now the, they've released uh, the recently their, their latest album in, I think, 2000, well, recently, 2016, 2017 uh, Woman. So they're at their their third iteration. And uh, I like where their, their style is going and... That's what we're going to be talking about today. All right. So um, what was the first track you heard by Justice? Um, Justice. Justice. I believe I'm hesitating because I think the first track that I heard was uh, the, the Simeon remix, uh, Never Be Alone. I think that was the first one. Yeah. The, the remix for um, well, We Are Your Friends. It was released as We Are Your Friends after, but the, the real remix was the Never Be Alone remix of Simeon. That was my first First track, you. Uh, I, I believe at the time I was working on a TV project. And um, quick story, the uh, the producer was really, really into Justice. And um, at the time they hadn't released uh, Cross just yet, but there were a few songs on iTunes, I guess. And uh, one of which was Waters of Nazareth. Oh, yes, and, yes, uh, yes. He wanted me to emulate that sound and I had like a week to come up with like five songs. And uh, obviously I was not able to <laughs> complete the task because when I started to, listening, to listen to that, I realized just how much work there was in terms of, you know, distortion and compression and then chopping up your own samples and, and this whole complex tro-ish approach. Uh, that they had back then and basically you realize that back in those days they they were probably spending like months on each of the tracks especially knowing as we will see in this episode today how they weren't really technically inclined at the very beginning of their careers and they were basically doing everything by hand and by instinct instead of using you know technology to speed up that process so yeah. from Waters of Nazareth, uh, obviously, I started to YouTube and Google these guys, try to understand who they were, why they kind of sounded like Daft Punk, but had their own thing going too. And uh, I've been a very, very big fan ever since then. Cool, cool. So um, why don't we go um, chronologically? 
chronologically, <laughs> I can't pronounce that word, uh, and, and, and talk about Cross first. Sure. What strikes you uh, in the production of Cross? It's very interesting because it's really a mix of like everything that they seem that they seem to like. It's very aggressive. That's the first thing you you realize. There's dance. There's DVNO. There's Phantom. There's a lot of distortion, and you see that they're very into rock and they're very into pop stuff and even new wave stuff. And I love how there's they create these soundscapes at particular places with beautiful chords and synthesizers. But at the other places, you get these this chopped up mess and distortion, like in your face, like razor's edge in your face. And that's what I kind of liked about the whole Cross uh, album was the mix of everything, as you would have super soft stuff and still banging in your face. And I I did go and see the show for that album uh, when they came in Montreal, and it was literally your head would move back at like every every note so much that the <laughs> the wall of sound was like so heavy it was uh you was you were kind of hypnotized by the sound yeah unfortunately i missed that one yeah i sure ma made sure i wouldn't ever miss a a, a justice date yeah. in montreal ever yeah. since but, but we uh, but we went to see audio video disco the tour right yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. uh Before we go into that second album, and I tell you what I really thought about that show, um, to me, obviously, I was more drawn to the pop and disco sounds of Cross. Uh, so DVNO, Dance were, were my favorites for a very long time, aside from some of the harder stuff like Phantom 1 and 2, and then uh, what of Nazareth. Genesis. <laughs> Yeah, Waters of Nazareth is a is an ear tiring one, so yeah. <laughs> I don't really listen to it all that much. I mean, I love the craftsmanship on the on the, the destroyed bass sound, yeah. um, but really, I mean, that's that's obviously the first real body of work that they put out, and ever since then, I studied it like mathematically analyzing everything that they did, and uh, for me, there's many different things that make this album such a classic uh when you hear justice copycats you can tell that they spent all of their time just figuring out the sonics of those bases whether it be you know synth bases or live bases that are literally destroyed by several layers of distortion and compression but for me uh there was um a hint of where they could go musically speaking And the way they put together chord progressions, especially, uh, is what really got me excited. Because if you listen to any of the Justice chord progressions uh, over the years, you can tell that they have a knack for finding that third or fourth chord that is not to be expected. And uh, I think that that's also something that's... Uh, maybe that's why we... Uh, compare them so much to Daft Punk, but because they have that same ability to throw in one weird chord in there in the mix and still retain that pop appeal. And so that was the first thing. The second thing was really how they were able to make everything exciting from a mixing perspective. And I was listening to this morning to uh, their like Q&A on Mix Masters. I don't know if it has anything to do with Mix with the Masters, the magazine, in which uh, I think Xavier was saying that uh, uh, they, they do a lot of things in the box, but it sounds so organic. And the way they achieve that is by, like I said earlier, you know, destroying with distortion, then bringing out some of the harmonics that get lost with compression and then destroying some more with um, distortion and, and so on and so forth. And I don't know, they, and there was even rumors, and I think they, they actually said that they did use some garage band like stock instruments, but when you listen to the record, it all sounds 
or it, it is uh, arguable that everything sounds analog in a way, you know? Since there's so much um, harshness and roughness to the sound and they love like overdriving things and over compressing things, it's kind of easy to lose the, the essence of the, the original instrument that you use at the beginning. And if you're able to craft the sound in a certain way that you're able to... to to, to capture back some of that like harmonic distortion and to to filter out some things that you you don't want or to over in, emphasize things that you do want in that sound while well, you're you're creating pretty much your own sound and I think that's why people think it sounds so organic is that they take strangely enough sometimes I think they take a mediocre source and they turn it into an idea or they keep only that small little snippet of like the sound design that sounds best or that's destroyed enough that it's going to fit in something that's going to be a little more a little bit more linear or some something that's going to be a little bit more less harsh and it's the way that they mix the harshness with the softness with the chord progression that you were talking about earlier that like makes the magic of like who they are and like people can't figure it out but at the same time that's that's how you do it you layer it you you overdub stuff you keep things you throw away things you keep just a segment of frequency of an instrument you you mix it with another one and people i think they're pretty much admiring the fact that they're being creative with the awesome tools that we have and more people should be focused on that these days. I couldn't have said it better. I think that going back to the uh, the idea of uh, emulating their sounds, a lot of people tend to forget that they also have these very highly melod melodious and harmonically rich portions of tracks to balance out the extreme harshness of the drops. And, uh, and so... To, to uh, summarize what I thought of Cross, I think that they weren't yet into their full uh, like shape in terms of writing. And as we will see in the, few, like the, 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 the albums that came out later, we will see just how good they are at writing music. But there was some of that. And then they showed us how creative you could get with the Sonics because, I mean... Nobody would have dared to mix and master an album like they did with Cross. And yet you have these super established uh, mixing engineers wondering and asking them how they did that. <laughs> and, and, and basically it's because they, they, they overlooked all of the basic rules of compression, EQing, saturation and all of that. So it really was an eye opener. Today... You could kind of compare them, not in terms of sound or the jar, but you could kind of compare them to, let's say, the Billie Eilish. They, like her and her and his, and her brother, they did exactly the same thing. They kind of went against the establishment, recorded everything by themselves, mixed it in a certain way, super simple, in your face, and people just couldn't believe like why it sounded that way and why it was so out there and so creative and it's the same thing for cross you listen to it and it's it's almost as if it was like like recorded in, the, in a garage you know it's like well how did you, do you get that sound kind of a like a, like a grunge band recorded somewhere but applied to synth and uh, with garage band and with reason and with all that you know like more contemporary um, I often think of the the white stripes when I listen to to Cross. I'm like, it kind of sounds like dirty, sometimes a little bit untuned guitars, but the energy and the it's like the it's so raw that you can't help but like notice that there's something there, even if it's not super polished, like an MJ record or I don't know an old record mix on a like a full fledged SSL with no background noise, no nothing. There's just this this energy, this rawness that you can't you can't help but not notice. Very well said. And then from Cross, I think they put out just and there was a huge band between Cross and um 
and audio video disco, but there was Planisphere, right? In between, which was the... The, the track Planisphere. Well, it's like a, in three movements, isn't it? Like, well, it's, like it's, it's the last track on audio video disco. Oh, they put it out on audio video yeah, disco. Yes, it's, it's the last track. It's my favorite track on audio video disco. Okay, because it, it did come out first as a, like an obscure single. Like they didn't push it or they didn't yeah. market it first. And uh, so let's talk about audio video disco then. Um, personally, it's my it's my favorite. Yeah. My favorite Justice album. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I love Cross for the sound, but I don't listen to it as much as it is, like I said, really ear tiring. Mm. So I can't really enjoy it over long periods of time. Whereas audio video disco for me is is really where they showed just how good they were at writing music. Mm, Production-wise and everything. Well, I mean, the production is kind of lackluster. If you really pay attention to the sonics, um, you know, it's kind of thin. Mm -hmm. uh, like the drums don't bang as much as cross, but the way the music is written, and you can tell also with all of the little winks that they, they throw at old-school rock bands that they... They are students of the game and mm. they they listen to a lot of music. Mm. To be able to write this kind of music, you have to to listen to a lot of stuff. Mm. But everything seems to be more balanced on audio video disco. No? I mean the palette of colors if you uh, if you will is uh maybe narrower. So the drums are less big and in your face, but I think they play a much more of a like a supporting role to the different ideas that they're trying to 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 put out there. So maybe that's why we yeah. think it bangs less, but at the same time, it takes up less space. So you have more space for the ideas and for the writing. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think they got better with the mixing and the using the computers. Uh, they, they, they said that in early in their career, they didn't use a computer. They used like a, an analog uh, sequencer yeah. machine. So, so, so I guess that the computer, either consciously or not polished their sound a bit well if you can save your tracks you can polish them more over a longer period of time right if you have to if you have to erase the memory from your analog sequencer every time you make a track you usually work faster and record it and then it's over and you lose everything well yeah but going back to the sound of audio video disco like there's no song on there that I'll I'll skip really you know stuff like Horsepower, you know, Newlands, Helix, Audio Video Disco. These, to me, are, are are incredible gems. Like the 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 songwriting in there is just amazing. It's just it blows my mind still to this day. And when did it come out? Nine years ago now, and it sounds fresh still today. I don't know. What about you? What what uh, what did you like about uh, this album? I must admit, the first time I listened to it since I was comparing it like a lot to cross and we had been waiting for like four years i think it was 2007 like they went yeah like it was 2011 when audio video disco came out and i remember listening to civilization and i was it was good but i was like ah, might there might be something missing or maybe they've evolved in a certain direction that we don't quite understand because we were coming from that that rawness, that like high energy, those destroyed drums, destroyed bass from Cross. But but you're right, over time when you listen to it and you're able to listen from like track one to like track 11 or 12 or whatever. First of all, you can listen to it like over and over and it's not too harsh. And like you said, they got better at production and like less ear tiring frequencies. And you can also see that there's like an, an overall idea of like a continuation from the first track to the second track to the third track. And each track is, is its own little microcosm, but it fits very well with the one before. So you saw that they got, they even got better at writing and better at thinking of like a bunch of songs and putting them together as an album. You do everything in a very raw, very instinctive ways, usually on the first album. And then on the second album, usually like most artists, they overthink stuff and maybe overproduce stuff and get influenced by external producers and everything like that. And for them, it was kind of different. And they sort of found a way to keep moving along, evolving, making something that's still them, 
but not a, a carbon copy of of Cross. And the songs, like you said, they're a testament of all the different bands and the different types of music that they love. Um, like Brian Vision is a perfect example, or uh, I don't know which one sounds a little bit like ACDC also. And I think it's Helix, right? Helix sounds a little bit like ACDC with like guitars that sounds really a lot like ACDC. And Planisphere also for me is a song I could listen on loop. It's a pretty long song. Yeah, I, I like the way they evolved and the way that it became a little bit more polished, less in your face, but you can't do cross over and over and over and over and you can't have Water of Nazareth over and over and Phantom over and over and Genesis over. You know, it's it's something you get hit with it and then you need something else and they need it to evolve to some somewhere else and that's what they did. And I think that's a great segue to for me to talk about my experience of seeing them live for the very first time. Uh and it and basically hearing them mix together and mix and match the songs from Cross and audio video disco and uh because i had seen you know across the universe a few times and i really liked the energy that they had on stage and 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 the way they uh they basically remixed their songs live but because of the sheer body of harmonies and and, and melodies that they they bring with audio video disco mixing that with the extreme energy and aggressiveness of cross is where i was uh, really blown away taken aback by everything that it meant for me musically because we have to remember that at that time edm was coming up and edm was really loop based and it was all about the drop whereas they were able as you've mentioned earlier that to bring down the energy rock style and with their incredible chord progressions they were able to build that emotion and then bring back the the sheer energy of distorted synths and 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 their incredible bass lines and all of that so for me i was like you need both you you absolutely need both and the body of work that these two combined together meant for me was like the 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 perfect uh, marriage of uh, musicality and aggressiveness. Like you said, the EDM was slowly creeping up, lots of artists, and they were doing it in the, like in a different way when you think about it. Because if you take like just the, the basic form of EDM, where uh, you got the intro, it's pretty high intensity already. Uh, you got the song, then you got that little fill just before... Um, Uh, the, the big break and it it rises and you have that I don't know those swooshing sounds and everything and probably four measures of something and then boom you've got your break everything explode and they basically do that over and over and over and justice it's like the total opposite yes they're gonna use that form in those arrangements sometimes but sometimes it's the total opposite sometimes it's super high at the beginning and then boom it just falls down and it's just chords and it's slowed down and it's not it's not always a very easy to dance to when you think about it but it it's got this depth in terms of composition in terms of note selection in terms of interest in terms of longevity that's why you can listen to their albums like from two or three years ago and still find them interesting because it's not the same formula that we've been hearing over and over and over again by different artists over the years. They've done it in a special way that you can't necessarily copy it because why would you do a, a certain progression seven times instead of eight? Why would you it why would you do it 12 instead of I don't know 16? And they're not afraid to do that. And that's what I kind of like about their sound. It's It's different. It's them. It's not. I mean, I have nothing against EDM. I have nothing about against those those eternal risers and everything. But if you listen to, I don't know, like those big festivals and even Ultra and all those big festivals, the artists they 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 usually use the same type of arrangements. They're gonna have like different chord progressions and 
like the Martin Garrix, they, they know how to do the chord progression a little bit differently than others. But in terms of progression and to, to have that big break where there's like there's the big energy, they pretty much do it the same way. And just as they're, I don't know, they're different. And that I think that's that's what we like a lot about them. Absolutely. And I think that uh, just to reiterate what you said, uh, what's unfortunate with what happened to EDM is the fact that the, the format became so uh, widely spread. Everybody was using the exact same formula in terms of you start with the drums and a bit, a bit of nothing. Then you have like a four bar verse, you dive in directly into the buildup and then you have the drop and then you duplicate that and that's it, you know, or you do double the drop and then, the, but they really built their struct song structures, I would say more in a pop and rock uh, way where uh, it's not so much about the drop, like everything is important. Everything uh, follows through, whether it be, you know, a breakdown with no drums and great chords. And um, they highlight each of these uh, sections of the songs without, you, like, like you said, risers and, and cliche sound effects. And it's way more about the way they, um, they'll chop up stuff and, and basically bring the distortion in so that the listeners know is something's about to happen. And uh, I think they're craftier in that sense, too. Um, another thing that really struck me about the aesthetics of audio video disco is uh, the video for Civilization. Uh, I think that they had way more budget and it, it showed. And, and, you know, Civilization is really spectacular, in my opinion. Not to compare them again, but... Uh, they went a little bit on the 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 Daft Punk front, where they they started using a little bit more animation and really like branding kind of their sound with video with different images um, that before wasn't necessarily linked to them. Before it was more of videos were collages of uh, different things put together. Or it was a mashup of their live shows and uh, uh, the energy that they brought on stage with their live shows. And now it was uh, a little bit more artistic. So with the, the evolution, with the, the way they produce tracks, well, they also had the evolution in the way they wanted to present uh, their singles to the world uh, with that great video. Yeah, and I think that also uh, they started to hint at where they were going with the cover arts of their albums. And I really like the fact that basically it's always just the cross, but in a, in a different setting. I think that's really clever, super, um, like it, it just works, you know? The uh, the cement or uh, concrete uh, cross in the... I don't know, it kind of reminded me, and I, th I heard Xavier say that in an interview, but it kind of reminded me of... 2001 a space odyssey in a way you know the monolith yeah yeah you know like the cross is coming out from maybe an old civilization and i guess that's where the the title of the track civilization comes from you know but to me i, I don't know I, i really resonated with that being a big kubrick fan and uh as we will see in the next uh album they they are really strong with these uh, those uh retro futuristic aesthetics One thing that I'll point out before we maybe uh, switch to uh, the next album is the fact that bass lines are kind of missing on audio video disco. Would you agree? Like I said, that album is very full of supporting items. Everything supports everything very well. Nothing is up front too much. The drums are not banging in your face. The, the bass line is also not taking a front and center role it's very very it's like a a nice loaf of bread that's what i, I see yeah. it as it sounds perfect but there's nothing that you're like oh this is extraordinary and then two weeks later you hate it but i think it was kind of an experiment for them also to say nothing is going to stand out but we're going to have this body of work that's going to be very well made uh, very well crafted and like something that you're going to be proud of and that they spent, I don't know, a year, a year and a half doing in the studio. 
But yeah, you're absolutely right. Baseline's not not quite there, but still straight to the point with a very supportive role. Nothing too assertive, but supporting. Maybe we should do a a few bass remixes yeah. for these, uh, yeah. these tracks. I should add some bass line <laughs> to those those great yeah. tracks because it's it's the only thing that miss that's missing for me. But um, so. And I think that they uh, they wanted to go back to baselines with uh, the next one, Woman. The the title track, uh, Safe and Sound, uh, is a perfect example of in-your-face baselines, chopped up, not chopped up, played live, remixed, and all kinds of nonsense. I I pretty much I, I like it. It's haven't played it. Uh, I'm not sure it was all live. It sounds natural, but when you play it, you're not quite sure if someone could do it exactly that way. But I'm I'm sure it was chopped in a certain way to to have that feel. But you mean the the slab bass on Safe and Sound? Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it it's playable, but it's it's difficult to have that um, the, the exact punchiness, and it's very precise. And that's oh yeah, it's difficult. No, for sure, to, it to, was chopped up. It, exactly. It's, so it's it's chopped up or like over compressed to have like a like like to be able to play that way. You have to be like super super good or like going through a lot of plugins and chop chop it up. But it sounds great. It sounds great. It's one of those tracks that I love playing playing with uh, when I practice, practice when I it? when I practice my bass. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I had this uh, feeling that you had on audio video, video disco with woman. Like again, uh, we waited five years for that one, uh, and obviously after seeing them live, I got even more hooked, and I was really, really anticipating that one. And honestly, after Safe and Sound, I was kind of at first disappointed because. I felt like they were they, they might go back to that that dance and DVNO sound where it's more disco and funky but it's it's really more of a and as we will see with what they made live it's more of a disco space opera with way more intricate uh harmonic ideas it's 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 really not a pop record is what I'm trying to say <laughs> I hear a lot of uh there's a lot of arrangement on that that album. And I think they kind of went the... There's a lot of string arrangements on that album, I don't know if you noticed. Uh, there's choir stuff and there's, there's... They really pushed the arrangement part to... As if they had pushed on... It was more raw on cross... And then production-wise, they went up a notch on audio, video, disco. And now they went all in on the arrangement and everything that surrounds their, their basic justice sound. They wanted to envelop it in a certain something more soft and something more... It even sounds a bit like a soundtrack for some, some kind of a movie or something overall. So... I feel I think they even work with an arranger on that for the the string parts and the choir parts. So it shows. I think it, it's it's very. Uh, they really worked at it, and it shows. Hmm. What are your favorite tracks on this this album? Uh my favorite tracks. Uh, to practice to, of course, safe and sound. I like. Uh, uh, Love SOS is pretty cool. I like that. I like Randy. Randy, I like a lot. Uh, favorite, probably Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal is cool. I like it. With one of the greatest videos. Uh, I, I watched it for the very first time last night. And uh, it's really cool. I really like it. Yeah. Plus, it's it's one of the most Justice-esque songs on the album. Uh, like it, it has shades of, you know... Waters of Nazareth, but with a cleaner sound, obviously. But you can tell that they uh, they brought back some of that good yeah, old energy, that good old like heaviness. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, me too. I love SOS, Safe and Sound, Randy were some of that, and even Alakazam is kind of cool too. I really like that. Yeah, Alakazam's yeah. not bad. But again, t 
to me, you know, the album is a slow burn. It's something that uh, you really need to uh, discover over several years. Uh, it came out in 2016. I'm just starting to, to realize just how grandiose the arrangement, as you said, uh, are on this album. The choir stuff, especially. I mean, the the strings are cool, but it, they're played in octave. is not It's not something very intricate in terms of music writing. But the choir stuff and the way they evolve over the, like the outros of the tracks, uh, is really something to uh, to to behold. It's very, uh, it's it like I said, it's grandiose. Like they wanted to make an opera. I feel you know. Yeah, they wanted and, to do uh, something else. It was like I, I'm sorry, it's an exercise in for me in arrangements. And, and something interesting you said about uh, about the the way it is played also. I, you can tell that it's 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 a patchwork. Like the keyboard parts are not played while, let's say, the bassist or guitarist are, are playing. Obviously, and you can tell that the swing is not quite. It's a bit static. So so maybe that's something they'll they'll explore in the next one. Um, also, the sonics for me are not quite right. Uh, I feel like the drums are a bit drowned in reverb. And I, and I could tell why they did that. Like they wanted to have this uh, homogenous sound and 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 have that kind of old school feel. But you know, having heard Cross, you can't help but want that smack also. But they also wanted to. I think the the way they did the arrangements and the way they're super simple and it's not that intricate. It was kind of the. A kind of a, a hint at the the way disco was written way back, right? And they yep, they kind sure. of I think they kind of did their own version of what they liked about disco from way back in the days, uh, with the strings and even with uh, the keyboards and the, the way some of the songs are have been produced. And it's interesting because I like it when artists do that when they they reinterpret an era or a type of track or a genre that they liked and that they were influenced by. It's uh, it's always interesting to see uh, how people interpret, I don't know, disco or soul or R&B. Yeah, and obviously they're not trying to emulate like the big Donna Summer singles. They're trying to emulate the more uh, polished and intricate, musically speaking, intros and outros of these albums. Exactly, there, yeah. There are these, these swooping and swooshing string sections and, and uh, everything is more up in the air if i might <laughs> uh, it's not so much uh, like a four chord progression straight straight to the point super catchy everybody can expect the exact same chord at the exact same time type of deal um, one thing that you uh made me realize though is the fact that Ever since audio video disco, there are in pastiche mode. I don't know what the, the English word is for that, but they they are absolutely kind of emulating all of their beloved classics. And I think if it kind of takes away from the magic of Cross, you know, where they were really just doing something that was unheard of. Now that they're more proficient in terms of mixing and engineering. I feel like they are um, more trying to emulate studio techniques than actually creating weird music. I don't know if you would agree with that statement. It depends. It depends how you see it. Uh, for them, it's it, it must be natural. And for them, I don't see that they see it that way from the inside, that they're just copying other artists now. They're just... They're just able have the technology have the gear have the talent uh to be able to 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 have these homages to the to all these artists that they they love then to to kind of be part of that sound by recreating it by in, reinterpreting it the way they think it should have sounded or something so it's always difficult to compare to the very first album because We've always said the very first album you have, you have twenty years to 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 write your first album, and then you have two years to write the second one, or one year to write the second one. The energy from a, the first album is always usually very raw, and it's very 
usually you don't re- you don't know where you're going you don't know what you're doing you just you use what you you master a little bit you use the little tools that you have and usually a first album is more a masterpiece in terms of um the raw the raw energy and what your subconscious just pushes out there rather than what you consciously put in every track, what type of producing you're doing with what the tools you're using, how you're using the tools. So it's always very difficult to compare uh, later albums with the first one because it's it's different person, different times, different gear, a different attitude, different way of seeing things. And maybe you're right. Maybe they're overthinking a little bit and maybe they're um, trying to... To, to not copy, but inspire themselves with uh, the thing that they, they loved when they started making music and what they heard when they were little. But I think it's part of their evolution. And I don't, I've learned not to judge uh, the way artists evolve because art is so subjective. I've learned to just uh, be part of their journey. And that's, that's enough for me. But again, I mean, I was uh, not in love instantly with woman but that's a good thing but once yeah for sure but once woman worldwide came out and and then iris then i was uh, complete again <laughs> you need to take no, it I in mean, you need to absorb it you need to listen to it a couple of times you need to see it in context mixed with the the the, the cross stuff with the audio video uh, disco stuff and uh, um for me i don't know but i don't know if it's the same for you but when i see a band live I usually see uh, their albums in a totally different way. Once I've seen how they mash things together, how they the the the, the link between all the different songs, where they cut, uh, what chord progression they use to skip the intro and everything, I listen with like uh, it seems like brand new ears. Like when we went to see the audio video, video disco tour. I re-listened to the album and I was more impressed with it. I was, ah, I, there's stuff that I hadn't heard and there's stuff that I, that there's this fail that I thought was totally awesome at the show, but that listening to it on the CD was, well, I didn't like get it. But once I saw it in the context, context of the show, I understood why it was written, why they put it together with that track uh, and mixed it with that other uh, uh, cross track or everything. So I don't know. It uh, usually makes me more excited to re-listen to albums when I go see the shows. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Justice, they have a knack for, you know, those unexpected chord progressions at the end of a five minute long track. And the way they highlight those during the live shows kind of takes you back to those moments where you kind of know the chord progression, but it's it might be a track that you fast forward when you listen to the, the album. But really... What I'm trying to say is live justice kind of makes everything that they ever composed spectacular, you know, and and the way they bring in the electronics even more for me works so well. Uh, it might be a good time to talk about their live setup, especially with Iris, which I think is uh, is just a masterpiece. Again, I, I watched the whole thing twice preparing for this um <clears throat> this episode and, and and for me iris is just uh is just stunning from the way they mash up the three albums together to the light shows to the the analog and digital gear that they have on stage it's just kind of makes me want to do the same thing <laughs> their show has always evolved uh, first time we went i went to see them it was very uh, the two guys in front uh behind their desk I think they wanted to do something a little bit different uh, more recently. Uh, um, well, that setup that you're talking about, the Iris setup, the one with their sideways, and they have pretty much, they have um, four stations. There's a station in the back when they want to replay some things and play them live. And then they both have their own station on the side, uh, mainly geared around uh, Moog Voyagers, uh and moog uh moog sub fatties and then and then there's the the center table or well, that's their dj their dj play their dj stuff um uh, mainly geared around they each have like two dgms uh pioneer dgm 900 mixers 
um, on each side. So they both have their their own things, uh, and then they probably have um, they probably do a lot of patching through pedals and through effects, but you probably don't see them. And they they probably have these patch bays on top, like those gray boxes that you see with like yellow buttons and everything. I think it's to switch setups. Um, to to go between different effects, I think that's how they work. Of course, one thing that impressed me on that on that table was the they really like their their three hundred threes. They don't have a TB three hundred three, but they have a TB O three, the new ones, and they have a TB three, the one with the um, those those red flashing lights. So they don't have the original three hundred threes. Live, no, live. They only have the TB O three. And the TB3. Uh, that would explain because I I asked you if you could uh, sequence MIDI like any any MIDI line, um, but have the output of the TB03. And because uh, you can tell on uh, on um, woman that they have some 303 lines that couldn't have been written or or sequenced on a, on an original 303. You know the the way they have the pauses and. Um, I don't know if it's, it's if just it's the way MIDI it's triggered written, or what. You can tell. Yeah, I, I, I would assume that is MIDI triggered, but we'd have to dig in. Uh, but yeah, if it's feasible, that means that uh, we should do it ourselves. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it depends. Like I said, it, 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 the internal. It's all about how you the slides. Well, there's not so much sliding going on. That's the thing. But the, the, you have the the distortion and the uh, like the, the the trademark filter squelchy filter on there. But in the, the I don't think there's distortion on the original TB three hundred three. But no, but I mean just the uh, like the trademark Acid House uh, three hundred three sound. Uh, they they do have on uh, on Iris uh, in a few places the squelchiness, the squelchy exactly. bass lines that we love. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's interesting about their live setup is that we don't see it, but there's probably a couple of computers in there. And I think they run everything from Ableton. And, they do. And those DGMs, one of the, the interesting things about those Pioneers mixers is that they interact very well with uh, Ableton directly. And also, I think, Tractor or Serato. So it's either one of those three or a mix of those three on some hidden computers. And probably the the, the, the big keyboards that we see them play when they go in the back and they, they play those piano lines, those are probably uh, plugins on another computer, like Contacts or something that the, they they patch directly into and and play them, I think. So, so what I uh, what I gathered from uh, some of the interviews that uh, I watched preparing for the show was that they got these custom made MIDI controllers to move from scene to scene uh, in, in, inside of Ableton, which allows them to not have, like you said, the the laptops on stage, which is probably a very safe move uh, on their part, uh, and and also. It makes it more interesting because if they're just looking at you know scenes in in Ableton on the computer screen, uh, it kind of takes away from the performance aspect of a of a such a, an electronic live show. But you don't want to focus on that. I think that's the the, the what most DJs get wrong when they use Ableton. You don't want to be focusing on how the scene switching is doing and everything. It needs to be programmed beforehand. And you need to be switching them on stage, be it on the keyboard, be it on the the mixers, the Pioneer mixers, and everything is synced so that you're performing. It's kind of like uh, you're you're not. It's kind of like playing the guitar. You're not always you're not always tuning your guitar. At some point, you're performing on your guitar, or you're not always asking yourself. Which one is the A string? Which one is the E string? Should I go? You're just playing the song and kind of looking at a screen with the scenes and following the waveform. That's kind of what you're doing. It's as if you're like being the mechanic of your your project and live. That's not what you want to be doing. You want to be playing. You want to be triggering. You want to be filtering. You want to be interacting with the audience. You want to be playing your lines. Uh, 
the lines that are not included in the playback on the Moog. Uh, you want to be switching scenes and focusing on when you're going to be playing that solo part on the piano. So that's what you, you want to be doing, not looking at scene changes on in the Ableton window. <laughs> Yeah. One thing I found really interesting and I didn't know was possible is the fact that those Pioneer mixers are actually just used as MIDI controllers. Yeah. You trigger uh, you trigger Ableton directly from the mixers. Yeah. So that's uh, that was really cool. They're MIDI controllers, but they're also sound cards because you're directly linked uh, to the, the computer via USB and you can use them as sound cards also. So... Yeah. For all those cats out there looking for a sound card and a controller, that could be something for you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And they also stated that they have actually no audio running through them, so it's really just a USB doing okay, all the okay. all right, cool, all the work. Yeah, I wonder though what um, like the sub fatties and Voyagers are doing. I know they are also using those as MIDI controllers during the live show. Yeah, I. I I, I think that I saw uh, Gaspar playing the bass line on, I think it's Alakazam that has this big Moog yeah. bass. Yeah. Not sure. Yeah. Uh, so, they play a so lot of bass lines. Sometimes they'll play. Uh, but what I really like is if you remember Audio Video Disco, there were some tiny little moments where Gaspar would play the keyboards and it would bring in that human element. Uh, you can tell that they are bringing way more now with this new tour. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they play the. They are allowing yeah. for mistakes to happen, basically. Of course, there's the uh, listening to some stuff from the, that show. There's places where they they fuck up the bass, and you hear it. He's like, there's like one or two, like two three notes. He's like, oh, I messed it up. Then he waits a bit, and he gets back on the the train. But, well, that's that's the live show, right? Um, I've always said. If you want everything to be perfect, stay home and listen to the CD. If you want special moments and things that you've never thought of and different arrangements and some mistakes through there, then go see a live show. And it's it's strange to see DJs slowly, slowly get more and more into that danger zone of, I need to trigger this. I need to be playing that right chord. I need to... Because even if you're doing just scene changes... If you if you fuck it up and you do it at the wrong time, man, there's something's gonna go wrong, you know. So they're exposing themselves. They're kind of doing like kind of like the Chemical Brothers, you know. They're if you do a wrong move, something can happen. And and the, I saw an interview where they said that they they were practicing for the the tour and they just brought all the gear that they had on stage and they put it all in the living room and they practice and practice and practice and they kept doing the show over and over again because there's there's many different things that can happen and you have to be able to react to it when they happen and not just have everything shut off and okay that's the end of the set yeah well i mean it, it makes me happy that they bring more uh analog gear on stage uh i mean the, the whole usb dj thing that was going on like in 2015 and and even to this day, it's kind of, I don't know, it's not really entertaining. I, to me, I need more than just uh, fancy CGI graphics behind the DJ to really get into a show. And I think that Justice are the the, the keepers of that uh, art within the uh, EDM scene, if yeah. you will. I also, I don't know if you noticed, but they've, before they, I think they, did they have screens? I don't remember having them having that many screams in the past, but I think they made a conscious decision recently to to have no screens in the back. Yeah, just well, just uh, uh, you, just a specific like a light show, like a rock show. You have a light show. You have these special lighting. Um, they have their whatever, be it their cross or no cross. I'm not sure if there's a cross today. Probably. Um, so signature cross and those signature Marshall amps to have that that rock that rock era a vibe on stage and then them playing in a kind of different configuration studio desk uh, moving around it's it's different it's something that uh, 
I'm a hundred percent behind. I think it gives it gives it a another vibe with uh I love how they're they're kind of in this square space and they have these lights that that glow like towards the sky, kind of like in Las Vegas with the fountains. And when they start the show, they're in the middle of that that kind of squarish light beam. And then the light beam becomes a little bit bigger. So it kind of it's reminiscent of the the Daft Punk pyramid that uh, I think they did when, when I think it was Coachella. But to your point, uh, they did. It was conscious and they did not want, you know, graphics on a screen because uh, Xavier said in an interview that uh, he didn't. Even if it's a huge jumbotron behind you, it still feels like it's constricted to a, a specific area. And uh, they didn't want that. And instead, they went with more uh, colors, like solid colors, to represent the emotion of a song. Uh, and uh, like, for example, stress, everything turns red, you know. And uh, I thought that was clever because, indeed, when you're at a huge festival such as Coachella, if you're in the back, even if, if the screen is huge, it's, it seems tiny because you're so far from the action. Whereas if it's just spotlights uh, going in all directions, there's no sense of dimension, really. You know, it's, 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 so I found that really clever also. And especially with the fact that everybody's doing like video game-ish uh, CGI graphics in the back, I felt that it was more. You're not a, you're not telling the audience as much what they should feel and what they should see while listening to the music. You know, they kind of the the audience can inter interpret more of the artistic uh, work that is being performed. Yeah, totally right. Yeah. Yeah. minimalistic so we're, uh, we're uh kind of running short we haven't spoken too much about their videos and their branding as we usually try to do uh what do you prefer with their imagery and the way they brand themselves real quick i find it very minimalistic kind of mysterious uh the cross you can interpret it as in many different ways not too many explanation as to what, where, when. Um, they kind of took that from Daft Punk to stay a little bit secretive um, without wearing helmets. It's pretty much a branding based on, I think it's the way they see uh, North America. I don't know if you've noticed that. They chose, like uh, I said, Xavier told in an interview that they chose the name so that it would be able to, like, you can say it in French, it sounds good. You can say it in English, it also sounds good. And their imagery was very, it's always, it was always, uh, the singing was always in English. Uh, the sound was very, yeah, we call it French house and everything, but it was, it was inspired a lot by the sound that was going in the United States and the way they interpreted it. Even the, the whole, the whole rock thing, uh, the leather thing, very, like, I see it a lot as like um, like Van Halen, like rock arenas, kind of they try to take that a little bit and transform it and use it in the electro EDM French house. And I think that's what their brand is kind of built around. Like, I don't think they're, but like, I wouldn't see a French song in Justice, right? I wouldn't, like a folk band. <laughs> What do you think? I uh, I think you made some great points. Um, makes me realize also that they actually didn't have to be as secretive as Daft Punk to still retain an air of mystery, but give to the fans something to listen to and to talk about. You know, uh, they they are very open in interviews, talking about their process, talking about their techniques, uh, and still. Even though they give give out way more interviews than Daft Punk, uh, the way they brand themselves, the way the videos are always very artistic and very um, groundbreaking, shocking, uh, they 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 kind of are able to stay very mysterious and still be in front of the camera. So I like that. Other than that, I I feel like the fact that the of that them being both 
graphic design students shows in the way they have their cover arts, their merchandise, their logos, um, and the videos. Everything is very tightly knit. Uh, like you can tell that they they have a hand in the way the videos are uh, shot. Uh, everything has you know like a, a a color theme, which is very strong and subtle at the same time. You know they don't need you know the, the whole uh, rainbow in each of their their things. Especially if you look at uh, Iris again, it's not over the top with the use of color. And me being a graphic designer, uh, at the very uh, core of my being, I resonate with that simplicity, elegance, uh, gives it more force. You know, I love Skrillex, I love Martin Garrix, but, um, and actually Xavier said that in an interview, they feel like it's just a tall glass of whipped cream. You know, you're full and it's, it's, it's too much. Whereas they'll sprinkle some of those things, give you some pastel and neon colors and bold colors. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's way more refined and um, it, it's not too sugary or too salty, <laughs> if I might use the, uh, the comparison with food. But uh, I don't know. I, I mean... I'll go back to Justice way more than I'll go back to a a Diplo or to a a, a Z for that matter because they they kind of keep they kind of keep you uh, starving for more in every sense of the word both musically visually and, and and with their releases you know they seem to be a little bit more refined yeah I guess that's the European way of doing things uh, not always as fast. Not always, like you said, less. Not always as sweet. When they they give you something, it's something that you can you can enjoy for for years almost. Maybe a little bit deeper. Uh, like you said earlier, it's not something usually that you understand right away. It's always a little bit. Uh, there's always a little bit of friction just to get used to, like what what the new sound is, what the new songs are, but. Once you've listened to it a couple of times, once you went to the show, once you've seen the, the live sets and you see all the work that went into it and you, it seems to be, in my book, it seems to be, it's, it's more timeless than many of the other acts that we see out there uh, today. Absolutely. I think that in 10 years, we'll feel even better about those albums, especially audio, video, disco, and, 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 and currently, um, woman um on this note i would urge our listeners to go on youtube and find the full iris performance uh to me it is what woman worldwide should have been and i'll explain why uh i think that they tried something in terms of live mixing with the woman worldwide and when i say live mixing i'm not talking about them mixing the tracks but they're like PA guy mixing the sound as they go. Uh, and it kind of failed because you don't have the crowd sounds. So they are, they're picking up some kind of huge stadium slash arena room sound. But all it does really to me is muddy up the sound. Whereas we have the direct out from the, the console on Iris. But with the imperfections of the mixing, because they're layering sounds within Ableton with their controllers and everything, so it's still raw, it's still imperfect, but it sounds way cleaner and tighter than Woman Worldwide does. So if you pay attention, compare, because it's the same thing, basically. It's just the way it got into the, the, the final computer for, for, for mastering. And so Iris, for me, is just, it's just perfect. It's uh, it's all of the great things that I love from uh, Justice, musically speaking. I mean, the laser show gets tiring, so sometimes I just listen to the music and not watch the screen. <laughs> but uh, it has everything in there, you know, from the like the all of these cool arpeggios that you don't get on the albums, like synth arpeggios. I mean, and uh, and then their incredible knack for for remixing their own stuff 
So for me, Iris is the uh, definitive justice experience. On my side, I'm going to recommend that people who already know probably Cross or Woman or Audio Video Disco to go back in time and to listen to uh, some of the remixes of other bands uh, to understand where they're coming from. I believe there's a lot to... There's a lot to understand about justice in the way they remix other people's stuff. And I really, I really enjoy listening to, to their interpretation of other people's stuff. Uh, on my uh, bucket list for the remix, I invite you, of course, Never Be Alone, Simeon, that's a classic. But I would say go back, listen to Electric Feel by MGMT, um, the remix for Justin Timberlake, Love Stone, which is pretty cool. Uh, the remix for Human After All, the Daft Punk song, also pretty cool. Um, they also did a remix of uh, Me Against the Music, the Britney, Britney Spears album. That's why I invite people to do go back and listen to some of the remixes and compare to what they're doing now with their albums and what they were doing uh, back then when they started with the remixes. It's, uh, it's uh, very interesting. Sonically, man, I I realize we haven't spoken about any of those remixes. I'll throw one more just for for good measure. That Soul Wax uh, NY Scene remix, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah, Soul Wax. Uh, especially if you uh, go back to Across the Universe, they that's like the 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 most uh, banging song on that first uh, tour that they had uh, with the crazy synthesizer there. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, they did plenty of stuff. They did Fat Boy Slim stuff. They did, uh, they did Nerd remix. She wants to move. They did uh, so much stuff. Uh, Mr. Ozo, uh, Lenny Kravitz stuff, U2 stuff, Boys Noise, Frank Ocean. I mean, you name it, they've done it. So very, very interesting to listen to their own stuff and the remix stuff. Good tip. I'll go back to that uh, Justin Timberlake one. I. Uh kind of forgot about it yep all right so take it away bk all right we're done here all right i think we're done here so i hope we've inspired you to listen to some more justice i hope the they inspire you on the production side on the live venue side and uh, your own productions and the way you make music and the way you think about music and the way you want to remix your stuff i hope you guys take some good points from this conversation and have a great week and Keep making those banger beats. All right. Peace out, guys. Peace. Thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. Remember to subscribe if you like what you hear. We're on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Also, if you want to support us, head on to DelicateBeats.com. You can find our serum packs, our contact instruments, and also plenty of freebies if you subscribe to the newsletter. Don't forget to follow us on social media.